This is Ben CB for Holy Mercy's Calculator with another tutorial video. Today we're going to be looking into analyzing your very first hand, comparing enumerated hand versus Monte Carlo hand. What is the difference? What should you be using? How you can import a hand, how you can enter all the details, and then how can you run your first analysis? Long story short, you should be using Monte Carlo hand. It is a lot more accurate. Enumerated hand is... is um, just a simple calculation with short stack mode. So here we just basically look into uh, push or fold. It does not consider min raising. It doesn't consider calling versus raises. It is very, very limited and also only to three active players. And it does not consider card bunching, which I will explain in a few minutes. Also, since it does not consider any post flop betting, which has an impact on pre flop ranges, uh, the results are a lot less accurate compared to Monte Carlo because the post flop betting has a huge impact. As the out of position player, you will always realize a lot less EV than the in position player. And here we have only push or fold. So no post flop betting, meaning the hands go in pre flop and then we let it run onto the river. But very often we have scenarios where the button can min raise, the big bang can call or three bet. So we have to consider some post flop action to get a lot more accurate pre flop results. Now, if we go into the Monte Carlo hand option, you can see this window opening. So you have now two options. Either you have a tracker tool where you have a hand, the button open shoves 22 big blinds or 21 big blinds. You click on the hand in play. Uh, usually it's marked, whether it's poker tracker, hand to note or holder manager. Here I'm using hand to note. You right click on the hand. Do not click on hand details, click on hand history. Now then you see this window opening and usually you have an option here, copy. And if you then go ahead and want to analyze a hand, you simply paste the stacks. Uh, let me just open a new one. You, post, you paste the stacks here and you see, boom, everything is entered. It even enters the PKOs. We have to turn it off. Not gonna look into PKAs right now, PKO tournaments right now here. We wanna be looking into a non-PKO spot. This is what something we're gonna do in the later stages or in, a, in a, another tutorial video. We're just gonna be looking into regular freeze out, no PKO involved tournament. And if we go back into the Monte Carlo hand, in case you do not have a tracker tool, maybe it's a live hand or you forgot to mark it and you just remember roughly the stack sizes or you saw an interesting hand on YouTube that you would like to use for studying. So we have this two, three, four, five handed scenario here. Under the gun has, I'm gonna simplify a little bit with the, um, with, the, uh, with the stacks here, I'm rounding it up. 20, 43 big blinds, 112 big blinds. Uh, 18 big blinds and 11 big blinds. Uh, we see that here, I'm just like chronologically entering the stacks, PKO off, so we don't need that. Um, you can just enter the big blinds um, and then it doesn't really matter. What matters are the big blinds accurate. It doesn't really matter um, the, the stacks, the chips here, because it's all in relation to the blinds. In case you have a BB anti, you enter the BB anti, but here we play online, so we have regular anties which are usually 10 to 12%. I think here it was uh, 12%, so uh, that's that's, a, that's all right. This is pretty accurate. And then on the right side, we enter the price pool here, which we have on the bottom, 459,000, 365,000, and so on and so forth. You can just divide it by 100, as I did here, 495. Again, the relation, the pay jumps is what is important. You can also um, divide it by by 100 and go even further. So, like it doesn't really matter, but I see the percentages. So if I add two zeros, the these numbers are not gonna change. This is what matters. In case, you, for later on, if you wanna run a multi-table um, multi tournament ICM scenario. So let's say this goes like here, 77, blah, 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 55. You might reach the scenario where then at some point you have 10th and 11th get this, right? So then what you do is you skip 11 and you say, okay, here he gets 15s, then 15s get 13. And it does automatically apply the pay, um, the, um, the, the placement payment for 14s and 13s get 13. And then let's say here 10. So then it automatically recognizes. You don't have to enter 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here. No, you just go to the next position 
uh, wherever you have the pay jumps and then you see it adjusts the, the relative pay jumps here on the right side. But we don't need this right now. We only need the um, top five are paid so we can delete everything here and you see, boop, we are back to where we want it to have. And then we are set to go again. Make sure you have Monte Carlo because of the card punching effect, which I will explain in a minute or two. We hit next. We're not consider any post flop betting here. We're going to be doing this in a later stage of the tutorials here push or fold only because we want to be looking into the small blind versus big blind scenario in case you had a similar hand maybe you had queen 10 off here and you're not really sure can i call this all in on the final table these are the spots you want to analyze this is very important homework to do and i will also share you a little trick and tip that you also need to do additionally in order to get a lot better when it comes to analyzing these spots then you click on finish and what we do now is we let it run <coughs> And then you get those ranges. If you make any changes or if you want to get accurate results now here for small versus big blind, you hit the run Nash calculation here. Um, just, yeah, decrease the CI target a little bit. Three, four, five is fine. You reset the strategy. Uh, usually for those simple push or fold scenarios, it shouldn't be running that long. But you can already see it right on the right side here, the, the rough range we're going to be calling. Again, whatever grid you liked to use. For these push or fold scenarios, I want to see the EVs because it basically shows you, hey, with queen four off, it's break even 0, 0.0. Jack six off uh, pushing here makes you 0 0.02 uh, equity based on the price pool, All right? If we look at jack six off here, we see the table equity. Uh, actually now, it, now since it was running, it actually turned into break even. So that's why um, let it run and then you get accurate results. 10, seven off makes 0.04% table equity based on the price pool. So here in this price pool format that I have, since I'm only using dollars, the price pool is like a thousand like dollars something, you see we make 61 cents. Not a lot, that slight profit in the long term and that hands like queen and off, jack nine off here, make actually decent amount of money considering that's just like a 10 big blind all in shove. Now, what is very important to understand why these why this scenario or this analysis with Monte Carlo is so much better and so much more accurate is because you have the card bunching effect. The card bunching effect basically considers the cards that are being taken out of the deck. Now, if you imagine being on the button and hijack and cutoff have folded, very likely they fold low cards. Of course, they fold some ace deuce or ace three off, but if they have a deuce or three or four X hands, they're 90% of the time gonna be folding those, but 90% of the time they're gonna be opening the A6 uh, maybe 50% of the king x hands, maybe 40% of the queen x hands, just to give some rough numbers, versus if unless they have ace deuce suited, like 95, 98% of the time, they're going to be folding in deuce x hands. So if someone folds in front of you, it means it's more likely they folded low cards. So the later the positions get and the more people in front of you have folded, the more likely it is they wake up with a calling hand because now more of the baby cards are taken off the deck and now more of the bigger cards are left in the deck. And of course, if... If some of these cards are taken out of the deck, the card bunching effect describes the likelihood of certain holdings being um, being held by your opponents. So if we right click on, for the button and you click on uh, no details, let, let it um, activate the run sampling and you see here a slight, very, 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 very slight higher probability for aces, and especially an ace card um, left in the deck. So the distribution after the button raises all in, now the likelihood of aces left in the deck. And you see, considering the baseline, that these lower cards are slower below, so there's a little bit of a less chance of these cards left in the deck versus um, the a6 hands. This is all what you need to know. But what is very interesting is if you do it for the small one, this is where you can see the effect really well. Five-handed, it's not as strong. But especially then, if you do it for nine-handed, seven-handed, eight-handed, and your button small blind, the impact becomes stronger. Because now, instead of only five, sorry, six or eight cards taken out of the deck, you might have 10, 12, or 14 cards taken out of the deck. And if we let it run for the small blind, you can already see going this significantly up. So an ace, king, queen, jack, X hand is now a lot more likely to be um, held by the big blind versus deuce x, three x or four x hands. Because if we go all in, since we're gonna be shoving with jack 10 off, uh, jack eight suited, queen deuce suited, king three off, we want the folds, right? We want the folds because we're gonna be shoving such a wide range. So we really rely on the fold equity. equity. Fold equity means the likelihood of your opponent folding. 
But with a bunch effect, card bunching effect, if already three players in front of you afford it, especially the button here who would open a lot of a6 and king x, it's very likely the button has folded a hand like 5-3 off, 10-4 off, all of these cards that we actually want the big blind to hold. So, and now if we would do this thing for six-handed, so instead of three players, four players have folded in front of you, this impact becomes even higher. So this will often result in certain situations that you see if you run this without the Monte Carlo analysis, that a hand like four, five off might be a profitable push. And you think, wow, I'm doing so good. I'm, I'm doing these pushes and I'm making money. But if you consider the card bunching effect, these hands become minus EV. Because now all uh, six cards are taken off the deck that are likely not an ace or king X hand. Now you additionally also having a five and a four, may, even taking more baby cards out of the deck, makes it even more likely that big like, breaks up with the hand. So these low cards, whether it's off or suited, are a lot less profitable to shove when you are not running it with a Monte Carlo analysis. So you do want to consider the Monte Carlo effect, which considers the card bunching effect. Don't worry if there are a lot of terminologies you hear for the first time, like bunching effect, Monte Carlo, it's not that difficult. That's pretty much it. It's just two or three terms. We're playing poker. It's a bit mathematical sometimes, but that's pretty much it. If you understand this, if you know this, uh, that this um, effect exists and that it can impact your ranges, you're already ahead of 90% of the players out there. All right. So you're doing already well. Already here, you watching this video is going to help you a lot for your game. So, um, and then what you want to do is if you think, okay, my opponent, um, he is a nit, he's tight, it's a big tournament, he's not calling so wide, I want to give him a tighter calling range. So then you adjust his calling range, maybe he's not risking his tournament life with these hands, maybe he's calling a bit tighter here, maybe he's even folding some of these trashy offsuited aces. So you give him a slightly tighter calling range, you see a lock appears, meaning now we lock this range to a different range, a bit tighter. But of course, we want to make sure now that we run a new Nash calculation. So what we're feeding it now with is since, hey, we are not considering or we don't analyze a perfect scenario. Perfect scenario would be us shoving the range as it just displayed and the big blind calling the respective 30%, 33%. Now we say we play against a weak opponent. He's way too scared. He's going to be calling a lot tighter. And these are the reads you need because they're gonna make you a lot of money. I, I have encountered countless any two shafts in these spots because my opponents are calling way too tight. So again, we reset the strategy. Uh, you don't even need to do the full tree, just the sub tree. So button and small blind here, uh, sorry, small blind and big blind, and we let it run again. Now let's have a look how it impacts our range here. It's running on the right side. We should see a change an adjustment in our strategy and you can see, boom, now it analyzes, okay, if my opponents fold five, six, seven percent more of the time than they're supposed to, we can shove almost any two cards profitably. It's just some really, some of these, ah, it's even getting further now. So maybe even we get to any two, let's see, should be finished any seconds, but you can, yeah, and even eight dues off <laughs> moves into break even. So against these kind of opponents, we can comfortably shove 90, 95% of the time. And maybe with three dues off or six dues off, a race, a small race does also generate profit. Now, this is a question we're going to be answering in one of the next videos where we also want to give us the option of raising. Maybe raising is more profitable than shoving. So this is how we really dive into the short stack play. Doesn't need to be perfect. Seeing some of these spots, comparing it, changing stacks, adjusting our opponent's strategy, and then based on that, developing the most profitable strategy. This is a grind. This is a homework. Reviewing final tables, plugging in some of these spots and understanding what are the spots where we want to be shoving relatively wide, what are the spots that we want to be shoving relatively tight. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And then I see you in one of the next videos. This is how you crush final tables. And this is how you get really, really good with ICM.